Father, thank you for this time that you've given to us. And Lord, we just want to pause now and come into your presence. And Lord, just say that we're nothing without you. And Lord, we're gathered together here in your name. And Lord, we just want to say that we are needy people. We need you. We're nothing without you, Lord. We love you. And Lord, we just pray for your mighty hand to be upon us. And Lord, I just pray that you'll help us to learn from your word today. And Lord, help us to truly have practical, uh, you know, things that you can truly apply to our lives so that we're changed, that we're just not walking out of here with a head full of more knowledge of Scripture, but that, Lord, we're actually allowing you to apply it in our lives. And, Lord, I just pray that you'll help us to be able to uh, do that very thing. You're the only one that can. Lord, we lift up all these private requests to you, Lord. We just pray that you answer each and every one of them according to your will. Lord, and according to your timing, which we know is perfect, and Lord, I just truly pray that you'll strengthen those that this need strengthening, those that this need hope and courage, Lord. I just truly pray that you'll provide that hope and that courage to them, those that just need physical strength or just need to feel better, Lord. We just pray that you'll touch each and every one of them in our church that has cried out to you for healing, for relief, or for physical comfort, whatever it may be, Lord. We just ask that you would supply uh, all those needs as well. But Lord, we wanted to say thank you for how you're taking care of us. We just pray that you'll uh, continually move mightily here and that, Lord, you'll help us to have your wisdom, help us to not take a step without it, or help us to fulfill your will. But Lord, thank you for these that are here. Thank you for our church. We just pray that your mighty hand uh, protection would be upon it, that more would be saved. Uh, the saved would grow and they would serve and Lord just truly feel fulfilled we just pray for eternal fruit from each and every one of their lives with the gift that you've given them and Lord we just pray for your mighty hand of power to be upon us and we ask all these things in Jesus name amen amen all right so let's do some Bible trivia all right so not just one person answering but let's let's see if we can get a lot of people answering how many how many books are in the Bible 66 books. All right. How many authors? About, about 40. All right. How, over how many years? About, yeah, about 1,500. Some, some will argue a little bit more, but around there. How many, how many continents was it written on? Two major continents, right? Yes, indeed. And, uh, uh, how many how many how many New Testament books are there? All right, and how many Old Testament books? Thirty nine. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's answer. Let's see. Uh, who was the one that divided the Bible into chapters? Do you remember his name? I could ask a million dollar question right now. Boy, Stephen Langton divided the Bible into chapters around uh, twelve twenty eight A. D. That was his name. So if you ever wondered where did these chapters come from, the Old Testament was divided uh, then. And then also it was divided into verses by a guy named R. Nathan. And that happened around A.D. 1448. And then there was a guy named Robert Stephanus who divided the New Testament verses. Uh, and that happened around 1551 A.D. So throughout, throughout the years they begin to divide. But the first complete Bible with chapters and verses was what? The what? No, no, no. The, what was it? The very first Bible have all the chapters and all the verses divided completely. What is it? No. Yes, the Geneva. Yes, the Geneva. Absolutely, the Geneva Bible in 1560. Yes, indeed. If you had that Bible, you'd be you'd be wealthy. Yes, indeed. Um, let's see. Uh, what's the, what's the middle of the Old Testament? Psalms. Some people will say Proverbs, but there's that one verse, yes, 118, with don't trust the man, the middle verse of the Bible, but put your trust in God. Um, let's see, uh, what's the middle of the New Testament? Second, Thess Second Thessalonians. All right, how many, how many verses are in the Old Testament? Yeah, now I know every Bible is a little different, but this is approximate. This is based on King James. So the Old Testament has 23,214 verses. The New Testament has 7,954 verses. And so a total, 31,173 verses that God gave to us for uh, 
living life down here. Correct. Yes, yes. All depends on what version you're using. This is all. This is King James here. All right. How many chapters are in the Old Testament total? Y'all didn't count. <laughs> Nine hundred and twenty-nine. How about New Testament? Two hundred and sixty. So the entire Bible has 1,189 chapters in it. Interesting, right? How many words does does the Old Testament uh, have? Y'all didn't count all the words, man? Y'all just sit around one day and just say, man, I'm so bored, I'm just going to count all the words in the Bible? (laughs) 592,439. Wow, and that's just for the Old. In the New Testament has 1,181, uh, 253 words. And if you put old and new together, it's 773,692. Yeah. Uh, Did they count these before they had a I doubt it. (laughs) How, How many times has the Bible been translated? How many languages so far? Yeah. Yeah, it's close. Yeah, well, it's Wycliffe is about that. And yet there's so many more languages still to translate it in. Can you believe that? They estimate over 2 billion people on our planet haven't heard the name of Jesus. Wow. So when in America, we think, well, man, are you serious? Well, I mean, I've met kids in America that have not heard the story of Adam and Eve or Noah's Ark right here in this country. Well, yes, ma'am. We take it for granted, don't we? Yeah. In fact, people, you know, there's countries sending missionaries to our country, you know, and we think, well, man, seriously? Yeah, our country's, our country's lost, man. Boy, it's, it's, it's turning into a buzzard quick, unfortunately. It really is. Uh, your Bible is basically, I would say, like a thousand pages long. And so if you look at, you know, reading it, if you read a page every five minutes, it should take you 84 hours or just under three and a half days to read it all. I met a guy in seminary. He read a he read the Bible through every month, so he wrote it twelve. He he read the Bible twelve times every year. Yeah, I was like, brother, let me rub some of that off on me. I was like, you got a court I can download some of that, brother. <laughs> I'm thinking, man, brother, I'm dying with all the study that we got to do, and you're reading it on top of all that. That's amazing. Yes. Three days? Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Somebody reading it. Oh, wow. Wow. Amazing. That, that is amazing. All right. Who was the oldest person in the Bible? How old was he? 900 and what? 69. What does his name mean? No. Methuselah. Yeah, that's what it means right there. It is, is, his death shall bring. And when he died, guess what happened? The flood. So that uh, he was like God's walking grace clock. Hey, so when this guy right here dies, this is when my grace ends for you. Yes, ma'am. They said 320? <laughs> wow. Wow. 320. <laughs> yeah, they had one question on Jeopardy. I, I, there's a lot of people expecting him to return in the clouds. None of them got it right. None of them. Wow. Boy. All right, so how many other people live to be over 900 years old in the Bible besides Methuselah? How many more people live to be over 900 years old? More 
than that. Six other people. Yep. Yep, six other people. Adam lived to be how old? 930 years old. Seth lived to be 912. Enos lived to be 905 years old. Uh, Canaan, or Kenan, lived to be 910 years old. Jared lived to be 962 years old. And then Noah lived to be 950 years old. Wow, 950. You imagine living that long, 950? Wow. You know, and you notice how the Bible says up to four generations that the Lord would bring evil upon four generations, but then he stopped that. But there was a time where he would bring evil. Well, the reason why he would bring evil on four generations is because granddad, who was evil, lived for so long. He had all those, all those years to influence grandson after grandson after grandson. So that's why, you know, a lot of them were up in trouble up into four generations because he had that much time to influence his, uh, his grandchildren, boy. Um, how many how many places were are, how many places are named, or how many places are there that people were raised from the dead? What's the number? What's that? All right. So he says four. Anybody else have any another number of how many resurrections the Bible talks about? People being raised. There's a total of ten. Ten. You got Elijah who raised the widow's son. You have Elisha who raised the Shunammite son. Uh, did light, a dead man came to life when his body was set on the dead bones of Elisha? Remember how his body touched Elisha and he came back to life? Jesus raised the widow's son. Jesus raised uh, the daughter of Jairus. Jesus raised Lazarus. Jesus was resurrected. Uh, and then many dead saints came out of their graves after Jesus' resurrection. How many saints came out of their graves? Over 500. And that was the wave offering. If you look at the offerings, you can tell all that's connected to all the offerings. Really, really cool. The first fruits, you know, when that, when that first wave was resurrected, that was like the wave offerings. Now, what, what's unique about Jesus' resurrection versus anybody else's in the Bible? What's that? He didn't die. Correct. He's the only one that didn't die. He was raised from the dead and stayed raised. He never, never came back, never had to be raised. Like Think about Lazarus and all them going to heaven. And then, then, then the Lord's saying, well, you got to go back. Sorry. <laughs> i got to go back. After seeing all this, i got to go back. Please, no, no. Boy, oh boy. Son. So, um, who was the first left-handed man in the Bible that was mentioned? And this is important, man. <laughs> it was a king. Yeah, starts with an E. Ehud. Ehud was the first left-handed man in the Bible mentioned. All right, how many times are dogs mentioned in the Bible? Are cats mentioned in the Bible? No, but dogs are 41 times. 41. Ostriches are mentioned twice in the Bible. Hmm. Let's see. Uh, did everybody ever speak the same language in the Bible? And when was it changed? And why was it changed? So what was their sin? Pride. Okay, what else? What else was their sin? There's a direct one. I'm looking at one, one very specific. That G Jesus told it to, or not but the, Jesus, he was there. But God told it to Adam and Eve and said, do this. What did he tell them to do? And and then do what? Scatter, right? So what were they doing? They were multiplying, but they weren't scattering, right? So they were di directly disobeying God by not doing what he said. And then what would you call that? I would call that Satan's first attempt to have a one-world religion. One world order, one world everything. So you can see that he's already tried it, and he's, he's going he's gonna to try it again. And uh, But God disrupted it. So when you hear people speak a foreign language, when you hear a different language, just remind yourself, you know, that's because of man's rebellion. Man's rebellious. And that's why people speak a different language, because God confounded their language. Absolutely. Um, there's only one boat mentioned by name in the Bible. What is it? 
everyone's like, don't look at me, don't look at me. Don't look at me. <laughs> it's mentioned in the book of Acts. Acts 28, verse 11. Castor and Pollux. Yeah, yeah. Let's see, who was the, who was the longest reigning king in all of Judah and all of Israel's history? Which one was the longest reigning king? Manasseh. He, he ruled for 55 years. Yes, indeed. Um, what did Adam and Eve eat in the garden? What's that? Okay, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. And thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This church has been taught right. No one said apple. Man, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, a lot. You'd be surprised how many people say apple. Yeah. Oh, I didn't hear you say it, brother. I didn't hear you say it. <laughs> yeah, but it's you know, apple. It doesn't say what. It doesn't say what he ate. It said the tree from the knowledge of good and evil. So it doesn't say what it is, but you know that that urban legend or whatever you want to call it. A lot of people think you know Adam's apple and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, but it's not mentioned at all. And, um, you know, with the term apple of his eye in Deuteronomy 32, verse 10, uh, you know, what is the word apple there in the Bible in Hebrew? You know, you heard, you know, she's the apple of my eye. What does that word in the Hebrew really mean when he's referring to Israel as being the apple of his eye? The word is pupil, the pupil. So in other words, when you mess with, you mess with Israel, it's like you're like poking God in the eye. Have you ever poked yourself or got poked in the eye? How irritating that is. Well, you don't want to irritate God, amen? Boy, you don't. You don't want to do that. Absolutely. All right, how long was Noah's Ark? Four hundred and fifty feet long, yeah. Yeah, you think of four hundred and fifty feet long, and how wide was it? All right, seventy five feet wide. Right, and how tall was it? Forty-five feet high. Yeah. Now, my dad went to Noah's Ark, and where I guess it's in Kentucky somewhere. Yeah, my dad said it's like he's it's phenomenal, and they have it all laid out. They they show exactly how all those animals could have been on there. Everything. Yes, sir. Why didn't they make it an Arkansas? Why didn't they make it in Arkansas? Man, I don't know. Let's ask, let's ask Brother Brad. He's from Arkansas. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I would love now. That would be a fun trip to take, would it not? You know, I would love for our church to plan a trip to go go see that because the Creation Museum is right down the road from it, and that's phenomenal as well. Where they prove that you know it's a young Earth and all of those things. Who is? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, sweet. They're making their way down here? Yeah. Fantastic. I would love to go to that. That would be fantastic. My, my dad said it was phenomenal. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, why were the plagues sent to Egypt? What was the sole purpose of God's ten plagues to Egypt? But who were the plagues against? No. No. They were against the people of Egypt. Yes, don't get me wrong. But they were specifically designed to be against every single false Egyptian god. So God was proving, hey, all these all these like frog gods and all the stuff that you, you, you pray to, I'm going to be God over all. So he was showing them, hey, I'm God over all your false gods. Yep. All right, how much did armor, how much did Goliath's armor weigh, according to 1 Samuel 17, verse 5? About 125 pounds. Well, that's a lot of armor. I mean, have you ever had like a 70-pound back, backpack on your back? And you imagine carrying 125 pounds? Boy, wow. And uh, what did David do with Goliath's armor? Did he keep it, or what did he do with it? He kept it. And what else did he do with the sword? 
He kept it. Remember how he kept it? He cut his head off and he kept it. Yes, absolutely. I'd probably want to keep it too. Look how awesome God is. Because I couldn't even pick this up by myself. <laughs> yes, indeed. And uh, let's see. Uh, how many how many uh, wives does Solomon have? Yeah, and how many concubines? 300. So that's a thousand women. Man, it would take him over three years just just to uh, spend one one day with just wow, boy. All the guys are thinking. I know what they're thinking. I'm not going to say it out loud either. <laughs> Seven hundred wide. What? What? Are you crazy? I was kidding. <laughs> yes. Yes. Why is this man? Ex- except for the, except for that part of his life. <laughs> oh my goodness oh my goodness all right so i've been thinking about this the jury is still out but i think I, I think i have it right who was the first person to be saved in the new testament in the new testament yeah i mean the old testament saints got saved the same way by putting their faith in god but, but who was the first one saved in the new testament Yeah, I had to write my brain good too. I was like, hmm, I thought I think I think I have it down. But I want to see if you guys disagree though. But I want to give you guys a chance first to think about it. Any guesses, any ventures? Man, he nailed it. That's who I said, John the Baptist. That's, that's who I think was the first person saved in the New Testament. Because you think about Andrew, he was kind of like the first one that you see, and then he's introducing Peter, you know. But but who was who was the disciple of John the Baptist? It was Andrew, you know. And that, then you know we know John the Baptist was preparing the way, making the way, and and so um, I believe it was John the Baptist. Yeah. Yes. They were confused, and what what he said was, is, "Hey, listen, John. John preached a baptism of repentance that you need to turn from your sin, and you need to, you know, turn to the Messiah. But he'll baptize you. Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit when he comes. And so there was just a little bit of confusion about baptism, but Jesus is going to baptize you by the Holy Spirit and by fire, uh, and that I only baptize you by water, or a baptism of repentance to get you to turn from your ways." and turn back to the Lord because that's who he was turning people back to. He was turning Israel back to the Lord, like the spirit of Elijah we had talked about and how, you know, everyone was against Elijah and it was Elijah trying to turn Israel heart back to the Lord and he came in the spirit of Elijah with turning the children of Israel back to the Lord. So does that does that answer the question? Okay. Does anybody have any other, any questions at all about trivia, about anything? biblical that you just may have a question now i'll be honest with you if i don't know it i'm going to tell you i don't know it but i will research it yes yeah and and i think in the in the original language it talks about it being uh the only way that you can get forgiveness is through the shed blood. Uh, right. Well, like, like like it says in there that the the blood of the blood of bulls and goats don't take away sin, but it's Jesus's blood. So, and when it says almost, like they put their faith in God, they put their faith in that in that picture. Hey, this priest puts his hand on the 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 goat or the lamb, and the first goat was the escape goat. Where all the it looked like all the sins of that year were being pushed or put into the body of that lamb, and then they would send it out of the camp. And then Jesus also died outside of the camp. He died outside of the gates of Jerusalem in the same way because they had to die outside in order for the sins to be taken away. So that's why Jesus died outside the gate. And so then they would have a lamb that they would also sacrifice. But Jesus did both. He was the escape goat as well as the one who took our sin. And so. Um, when it talks about almost, I believe that's referring to how the blood of bulls and goats uh, couldn't take away sin. However, all things are purged 
by blood because the Bible says the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin and so I think when it's talking about almost it's referring to animal blood not the Lord's blood there yes Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Yes, there's a lot of people that think they've committed that, you know. And I always tell the people that, that have ever, ever said, hey, you know, I think I might have messed up and, and I think I might have blasphemed the Holy Spirit, you know, and they're all worried about it. Well, the ones that are worried about it haven't done it. It's the ones that don't worry about it. They have no conscience when it comes to that. You know, and when it comes to blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, in order for that to happen today, the way that you blaspheme the Holy Spirit is by rejecting Jesus ultimately you know if you die rejecting jesus that is blasphemy of the holy spirit why because when god the father said all manner of evil spoken against me will be forgiven then the son came and then jesus said all manner spoken against the father and the son will be forgiven and then the holy spirit's come and he's the last roadblock to hell so when you deny or reject the holy spirit you're rejecting god the father god the son and the holy spirit so there there is no other other one coming so when you say no to him you say no to him forever and uh, unless god had mercy on you and comes back and, and and grants you another opportunity does that make sense to you but the reason why the pharisees were guilty of it is because when jesus did miracles they contributed the the works of the devil to the holy spirit and basically what he was saying was is that man you've completely blasphemed god you know the devil number one devils can't do this number two you, you know that it's got to be a work of God doing this. And so when they saw the work of God, they contributed it to the work of the devil. And when they, they spoke what they spoke, it was just showing that they were already guilty of rejecting God because their hearts were completely hardened or they would have never said what they said. They would have never contributed to what Jesus was doing to the works of the devil. But because they did, it just showed already that their hearts have already crossed the line. They rejected the Lord uh, in their hearts and as a result of that that was their last straw is that they blasphemed the Holy Spirit to where they were no longer going to be given an opportunity during that time but now in order to do it Jesus would physically have to be here to do that but he's not so blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is when you reject the gospel and say no and if you say no for the final time without giving your heart to Christ well then you're unforgiven forever yes Oh, 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 I'm sorry, I missed that. Well, I would say... That's what I was saying. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's the only, un, the only unpardonable sin is when you reject Jesus and you die in that state. That's the only unforgivable sin. Every other sin is forgivable except for rejecting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That sin is unforgivable when you die in that state. And uh, that's why you have to be alive, breathing air. Today is a day of salvation, the Bible says. Absolutely. But think about how horrible that sin is. You think about all the sins that were committed during the World War II uh, in the concentration camps, all that despicable, horrible, unspeakable things that they did, and yet there's a sin worse than that, and that is rejecting Jesus. You know, because the Bible in, in John, 1 John, commands people to believe the Lord Jesus, believe on the Lord Jesus. It, it's a command. So if you don't believe, then you're sinning against God because you're not believing, you're not trusting in who he is. You know, that painting on the wall, if I were to say to you, hey, who painted that? Would you argue with me that there's a painter? Now, you might argue over who, 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 who was the one that actually painted it, but however, how do we know there's a painter? Because the evidence on the wall, which is a what? A painting. So if there's a painting, there's got to be a... If there's a building, there's got to be a... If there's a creation, there's got to be a... You see, so atheism is never, ever a head problem. Atheism is a heart problem where they willfully, willfully want to become ignorant and push truth down or put truth out of their mind and heart and replace it with error. Boy, yes, indeed. But I'm sorry, but I hope that... Does that answer your question? Does that... Everybody's good with that? Are there any other questions? Yes. Correct. I think I think he was doing it just for for us being human. Hey, I'm telling you that I am going to prepare a place for you. So in other words, don't doubt me. 
or I wouldn't have told you this. I wouldn't have told you. In other words, what, what, what I'm saying to you, everything that I say to you is true. Everything that I say to you by definition is a promise that will be kept. And so I think for hu human benefit, he was saying, hey, man, listen, I wouldn't be saying these things. Everything that I say is absolutely true. And so I just think it's God just showing his, uh, his, us his way of being patient and gracious with us. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. In other words, uh, that that too, brother. Yes. Hey, there is another place when you die. There's a place that you're going to go. We're looking for not built with human hands, but God's hands. And um, and so you know, and I just think you know, the Lord also knew that you know the disciples also struggled to believe all throughout the Gospels. When you read, you know, hey, you're, you're not able to handle this right now. But then later on, you can see where God opened up their mind to understand what was being said. So I think that He spoke to them on a level that they could totally understand. Yes, indeed. Yes. Verse are you reading? Uh, eight. At the end it says, Chapter nine, verse eight. Chapter nine, verse eight. The Holy Ghost is signifying the way. Yeah, I mean Hebrews oh, chapter. Hebrews chapter eight. Oh, eight, eight. Okay. Okay, so that if the first covenant had been faultless, then there should be have no place been sought for a second. So that's talking about the Old Testament and the New. Right. Yeah, the line out of the tribe of Judah. Yeah, he had to come from Judah, absolutely. That's That's the kingly line. No, I, I think here what he's talking about, he's just showing the distinction to why, number one, Jesus is better. Number two, why the new covenant is better than the old covenant. And so he's making that distinction, and he's bringing Israel and Judah, which were split all those years. He's bringing them together uh, under under one Lord, one king, kingship. And so when, he, when it talks about him coming out of Judah, it's always representing his kingship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Now remember in Jeremiah, he prophesied that I'm going to take the heart of stone and replace it with the heart of flesh. I'm going to make a new covenant with them. Well, he's talking about how the Holy Spirit was going to be in us in the New Testament versus uh, how the Holy Spirit would come and go upon people in the Old Testament. Does that, does that answer your question? I hope. All right. Did you have a question? She used to care for a lady. They would talk and pray together. She has since gone into a uh, nursing home. Okay. Because of Alzheimer's. And when I would go to see her, I would try to stimulate her in terms of what we used to talk about in the Bible and whatnot. She no longer responds. She won't pray with me anymore. Mm. That's not rejecting the Holy Spirit, is it, when someone is so mentally... I would say no. I would say no. Yeah. When yeah, when their their mind goes like that, I would say 
no at that point. Oh no. No, if she's truly born again, no. If you're truly born again, the Spirit of God stays with you. Yeah. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Never. Never means never. Leave you, that means leave your body. Because if they did leave your body, then you would lose your salvation because the Bible says in Romans 8, those that have the Spirit of Christ are his, and those that don't have the Spirit of Christ are none of his. So you have to have the Holy Spirit to be saved. So, yes, if somebody got dementia or completely just, you know, their whole memory got erased, they would still be saved. And God has their record in heaven, absolutely. Yeah, he would come and go. Yeah, he would never. He didn't dwell in people in the, in the Old Testament. He would just come and go. So if they were saved, it would still turn them in. Yes, because they put their faith in God, who was going to send a Messiah that was going to take care of their sins. So think of it this way: in the Old Testament, everybody got saved on credit because Jesus didn't shed his blood yet. But they were putting their trust in God that he was going to send a Messiah that was going to take care of all their sins because they knew God was just and had to punish sin. New Testament, we get we get saved by cash because Jesus already made the payment in full with his shed blood. Does that make sense to you? But but you have to put your faith in God either way. You get saved the same exact way, Old Testament, New Testament, by putting your faith and trust in God and that he was going to send a Savior to take care of your sins. And he did. Praise the Lord. Yes, indeed. Does that make sense? Yes. And that's talking about hell. There was that one compartment where... Uh, the rich man is still burning today and then there's the other side which was Abraham's bosom which was paradise and uh but the Lord had to be able to keep them in a place because the blood of bulls and goats didn't take away their sin so he had to have a, a, a place somewhere in paradise we don't know exactly how all that worked but we do know that there was this compartment where they could see each other they could converse with one another and they had that chasm that was fixed well Jesus went down and that side and let all those people out of there into the presence of God because his blood was now shed, their sin was taken away, and they were allowed to be escorted into the presence of God. Does that make sense? So one side of it's empty, the other side is still still filling up, and then that side is going to be emptied out at the great white throne. God's going to pull all those people out of hell. They're going to also receive a new body themselves because the Bible says those that knew their master's will and didn't do it will receive many stripes. Those that didn't know their master's will and, and did things that were wrong will receive few stripes. Remember what Jesus told Pilate? Remember what they what, remember what they said? I couldn't believe they said it, but they said it. They said, let his blood be on our head. That was the last thing they should have said. Boy, that was the last thing they should have said. But remember what Jesus said to Pilate? They have the greater sin. They have the greater sin. And why would Jesus say it's going to be more tolerable in the day of judgment for, for Tyre and, and Sidon than it would be for that generation that he was preaching to. Because he says, if Sodom and Gomorrah saw the miracles that, that I've done, then they would have repented a long time ago in sackcloth and ashes. And here you have the living word, God Almighty in the flesh before you doing these things, and yet you still don't believe. So it's going to be more tolerable for them because of their ignorance of my word than it will be for you who here I am standing before you, giving you the living word, because I am the living word. Wow. So God teaches us that there's going to be degrees of punishment in hell. And so when they stand before God at the great white throne, it's not to determine whether they go to heaven or hell. No, they're going to hell, but it's to determine their punishment for the rest of their eternity in the lake of fire. Boy. You know, that's why the Bible says in Romans, you're storing up wrath for yourself. So the more you sin, you're storing up more and more and more and more of God's wrath. You're storing it up. And so it gives the idea that, hey, you know, man, that bill's coming, and that bill will be paid. And you could have had it paid by your insurance man, Jesus, but if you didn't, then you're going to pay for that bill yourself, and that's going to be eternity in hell, separated from God for forever. Boy, yes, indeed. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Yes.
turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. All right. So then he says, uh, in verse 9, we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building according to the grace of God which is given unto me. As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed on how he build thereupon. Look at verse 11 of, of, of chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. It says, For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work, every person's work, shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man every woman's work of what sort it is and if any man's work abide which he has built there upon he shall receive a reward if any man's work shall be burned he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved yet as by fire so the word of God teaches us that we're going to suffer loss you know suffer that word suffer if you look it up means you're going to be disappointed like ah man now at the same time just the very fact that you're saved, that you're there, will be enough, I believe, already, you know, let alone the Lord giving me a reward for what? For what you did in and through me? Because I know I didn't do it. So if I do get a reward, it's going to be what he's doing in me and through me anyway. And like we talked about, you know, that's done in love, by faith, for the glory of God. You know, those three things are the standards that I see scripturally that would make what a good work is and, and what a bad work, because it talks about, not just works, but it talks about are they morally good, are they ethical, those type of things. And so, yes, God sees us right now, present tense, as forgiven. If you're saved, you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're, you're forgiven, uh, your eternity is secure, and uh, in one sense of the word, you don't have to ask for forgiveness because you already are forgiven when you got saved. You, you received all of the Lord. He's forgiven you of all your sins, past, present, and future. Every single one of them are done away with. We're seated in the heavenlies, the Bible says, and that we're glorified. So he sees it all together, all from one from one end to the other. All He sees it all together. So as far as he's concerned, yes, we're forgiven. We're made righteous because of the gift that he gave to us. He took our sin. He gave us his righteousness. So positionally, every one of us that know the Lord Jesus are positionally righteous before the Lord. We're perfect in his eyes for all eternity. Now, however... Even though I'm saved and I'm positionally made righteous permanently before the Lord and he sees me as perfect because Jesus gave me his perfect righteousness. However, I still have to live out my life practically. So the Lord has to live out his righteousness that he gave me in a practical way. And that's what we call sanctification. Making me, conforming me, conforming you into the image of Christ more and more on a daily basis. And uh, whatever that, whatever comes down the pipe, you know, the Lord's going to work it all together for the good to those that love him and are caught according to his purpose. All things work together for the good. And so he's taking all that and molding you and making you into the image of his son, like it says in Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And so um, when you look at suffering loss and those type of things yeah there's coming a day where the bible says the former things will no longer be remembered and all the tears are wiped away and all the former things and that means you know sin and everything formally you'll you'll completely god's going to completely erase our minds but that doesn't happen until after revelation chapter 22 because it says god will wipe away all their tears well what happened in revelation chapter the chapter before that in 21 all tears will be wiped away well chapter 20 was the great white throne judgment and then it says right after that, then all the tears are wiped away. And then the former things are no longer remembered. So, yes, I believe in a practical sense, there's coming a day where we're not going to remember anything. All of our sins are going to be forgotten. Nothing's going to be re re returned. And we'll forever remember something brand new. But until that time, because God does see it from beginning to end, you know, he knows my past, he knows my present, he knows my future. But from his standpoint, I'm still perfectly forgiven. I'm positionally made righteous because he's given me the gift of his righteousness. He'll never take that away from you. He'll never take that away from me. So far as I'm concerned, you know, that's why the Bible says in the Greek, you, you're being saved, you are saved, and will be saved. So it says all three in the Greek. You are saved, you're being saved, and you will be saved. So when you add all three of those together, once you're truly saved, you're saved forever. So you just got to put all those three together. I, I hope I'm answering your question. 
um, to the best of my ability, yes. Right. Correct. Yes. Yeah, and missing your service, missing your soldiering. Right. Would what be grieving the Holy Spirit? Miss opportunities? Yeah, I mean, I, now if, you, if you know better and you know, hey, I, hey, he wants me to go teach this class, or and, and you know that he does and you don't do it, yeah, that would definitely be a, a grievance to him. That would, yes. No, 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 no. No, grieving the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with losing your salvation at all. No, it, like it says, you don't quench the Spirit, don't grieve the Spirit. You know, it's like it's like with my kids, hey. You didn't clean your room. Well, you know, they give you whatever excuse. It, 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 it's like grieving. You're like, you're not doing what I told you to do. This is what I need you to do. So in that sense of the word, yes, yes. But grieving the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with losing. You can't lose your salvation at all. And uh, But, yes, you can grieve him. I mean, you can, like, have you ever grieved your husband or your wife being married? Boy, you, you can grieve him quick, ain't, amen? <laughs> have you ever lived with somebody that you grieve? Boy. So, yeah, we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. Amen? And, uh, man, oh, man, let me see here. Uh, Romans, let me see here. Um, let's see. Romans 14. Let's see here. Look at um look at verse fourteen. Or I'll tell you what, look, look at verse eight first. For we for whether we live or we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why does thou set at naught, or hold your brother in contempt? Now notice what he says right after holding your brother in contempt. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself. There's that word account, a verbal rendering back to, of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and I'm persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him or her is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be spoken evil of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy. And the Holy Ghost, for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approveth of men. So did you notice what he says though here in verse 10? But why do you judge your brother? Why do you hold him in contempt? For we shall all stand before what? The judgment seat of Christ. So going back to saying, you know, as a Christian, you know, the Lord never tells you in his word to say, now you need to ask me for forgiveness in order for me to restore my fellowship. What does he say? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Well, when you look up that word confess in 1 John 1, 9, if we, now the Apostle John is including himself in that, so he's saying, hey, I'm a sinner too. If we, if I, John, confess my sins, plural, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So what is the basis of our fellowship with the Lord? Confession. That word there, if, is like a contract. If you do your part, 
then I, the Lord, am going to do my part. Now, I, the Lord, am not going to force you to confess your sin to me. I'm not going to force you to repent. I'm going to convict you. I'm going to show you your need to repent, your need to confess and turn from that. But I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to put a chain on you and make you do that. So if you confess, what does that word confess mean? It means to say the same thing. That's what it literally means. Say the same, speak the same thing. So in other words, whatever God's convicting you over, whatever sin that may be, or whatever wrong that may be, he's saying confess that. Agree with me that what I'm telling you is sin and it's wrong in your life. So say the same thing that God would about your sin is what that word means. So I know we as Christians say, Lord, forgive me. I shouldn't have said that. Lord, forgive me. I shouldn't have done that. You know, and that's fine. And I, and, and I know he understands our lingo and, and where we're coming from with that. We're confessing to him. But if you want to be biblical, you have to say, Lord, what I did was wrong. It's wicked. I call it sin like you do. Lord, I'm willing to turn from that. Please, please wash me, cleanse me. And uh, the Bible says that if you'll do that, he will. Why? Because the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Now, my sin, even though I've sinned, what, what, is my, what is my basis of getting in fellowship? Confessing. So I confess my sin to maintain my fellowship, never, never to maintain my relationship. My relationship with the Lord is always 100%. He loves me. Nothing can separate me. Did you even notice in Romans where it says nothing can separate us from the love of God, and then it goes to all the depths and the heights and all these things? Then it, sees, then it says, nor things present. Nor things present. All right, that means present tense right now. Well, what is present tense here right now? Sin is present in the present tense, is it not? Nor things present, nor your sin can separate you. Why? Because the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sin. So when we stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ, the thing, that's why he says, hey, why do you judge your brother? Why are you judging your brother? Why are you holding him? And Don't you know you're going to stand before me one day and give an account of your life? So I think... There are sins of commission and sins of omission. And the Bible talks about a sacrifice for God paying for all the sins that people were completely unaware of that they were guilty of. Well, when Jesus died on the cross, he died for all those kind of sins as well. Every single sin that you ever have sinned or ever will sin, he paid for it in full. Mark it down, period. So you're secure in him once you're truly born again. But you have to confess on a daily basis. That's, our, that's, our, that's, that's why Peter said, well, wash me all over. And Jesus said, I've already washed you with my word. You're already saved, but you just have to have your feet washed. So confessing of daily sin is how we maintain our fellowship with the Lord uh, and get close to him once again. So it's going to be on that day where, hey, you know what, Lord, I, I, I wasn't aware that I had an attitude towards brother so-and-so. I wasn't aware that I said it, and it came off that way, and I really hurt their feelings. Lord, you're absolutely right. Man, I confess that to you. And if that turns into wood, hay, and stubble, because, you know, I didn't do it for God's glory. I didn't do it in love. I didn't do it for the benefit of other people or the benefit of his kingdom. Whatever that may be in my service to him, if it wasn't done in love, by faith, for the glory of God, it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble. It's going to be burned up. And so uh, I think I will. I think you will suffer loss. Like, ah, oh, man, boy, you know, I see the seriousness of it now. I didn't see it then, and I'm so sorry. So I think, honestly, it's, it's going to be where... Notice how the Bible says he presents us to the Father without wrinkle or spot. Well, where are the wrinkles and spots coming from if we're truly forgiven and justified, which we are? So it's talking about the practical side of sanctification. As we go, so we go through time and space, Jesus, God lives outside of time and space. He lives outside of creation. It's just like when I look at my car, somebody created that. If I created it, I can get inside my creation. I can drive my creation. I can do what I want to, but then I also have the ability to step outside of it. Well, God also lives and exists outside of creation. He, that's how awesome he is. And so when you look at Judgment Day, there's that practical side of it. You know, God doesn't exist in time like we do. He sees it all together. But for us, we got steps that we got to take. And one of those steps is the judgment seat of Christ. And I think that's where if you have bitterness or anything unresolved, something that you did that you were unaware of, that's why it says every hidden thing, every hidden thing will be revealed. Then every man will have praise from God, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, where it talks about stewardship. It says every hidden thing will be revealed, every dark thing. Then everyone will have praise from God. So there's going to be a time where you're going to go look, stand with Jesus privately. All the things that need to be confessed, how do we get fellowship? How do we get all the spots and wrinkles ironed out? It's through that confessing time. 
Not condemning time because you can't be condemned, but that confessing time. Okay, here's what remains. And then it says after that, then he's going to present you publicly, present you to God the Father. And then the Bible says that you'll, you will be rewarded openly. That's when you're going to get your treasures and all the things that you did for his service. But everything else will be smoothed out, wrinkles out, spot out. And he's going to present you to God the Father in that practical way in perfect righteousness. So look at, the, look at the judgment seat as a time of getting the wrinkles out, the spots out, if you will. You know, those things that maybe, you, you know, you know now, now that you bring that out and point that out, Lord, I totally see it now. I didn't see it then. Lord, I confess that to you. I'm sorry. Whatever, whatever it may be, whatever it is we're supposed to say, I know we'll be instructed, I'm sure, but it'll, it'll all be smoothed out, clean. But think, remember, though, you're standing before the one that died for you, that loves you with all of his heart man who, who loves you more than you could ever love him that's who you're standing before so i think it's going to be a time of reverence but it's going to also be a time of you know man lord regret but i think it's also going to be a time of just man i'm so glad i'm saved amen amen all right any other questions i hope i didn't bore you today by doing this because i you know, if you have questions man please ask away yeah Colossians it says that he existed before all things Jesus did and then it says that in Hebrews that Jesus uh, uh, and also in Revelation it says that Jesus Christ died uh, before the foundation of the world in other words he was already considered dead before the foundation of the world was even here he's already considered crucified the Lord was crucified before the foundation of the world so in other words in the heart of God the Father God the Holy Spirit and the heart of God the Son it was a done deal because it says that you know he was uh crucified before the foundation of the world so it was already predetermined by god for him to do that very thing i, I i'll give you the scriptures I'll, I'll send them to you and um oh the question was is um go ahead brother you answer you, you, you. <laughs> Revelation 13, 8, all the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast and whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. So, yeah, once again, it was predetermined that Jesus would be crucified before the foundation of the world. And it was also mentioned that he died one time forever for sins. So it's very crystal clear he died one time forever for all sins. So his death can never be repeated at all. And so he either died for all sin or he didn't die for any of it. And the Bible says that he did because the Bible says the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Amen. So Revelation 13, 8, it says, uh, They were not written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. So Jesus Christ, as it says, that if he had to die for the sins of the world, then he would have had to start dying before the creation of the world as well. So that's why he died one time for sin forever so yes it was the predetermined plan before god created adam and eve that christ would be crucified because he knew that people would sin and mess up that could be a very difficult question for people you know well, well if he knew that well then why did he do this and why you know, i don't know i'm not god all i know is that you he sent his son that you better believe you better repent and you better put your trust in him because that's the only way off this planet and he didn't ask me to understand it all to be able to explain it all because if I could well then he wouldn't be God if I could explain him right but uh but it can be very difficult d difficult questions and like you know well, if he knew all that well you know at the same time I like what uh, one man said he goes you know the very the very core nature of God the the ex the ex the uh what is it what was the word he used the um uh 
you know, God in all of his perfections, every one of them are, are perfections, but, you know, at his core is love. You know, God is love. And the very fact that God is love, he can never go against his nature because the Bible says the Lord changes not. And so perfect love demands that people have freedom and have the freedom of a choice. Because if I make you love me or force you to do things or force you to stay or force you to feel a certain way about me, well, then what do you call a person that does that? That's a tyrant. So the very fact that God is love, his very nature dictates what he can and what he can't do. And one thing that he can't do is force people to love him or to like him or to choose him. And um, so that's why we do have freedom of choice. You know, and I would say true free will was given to Adam and Eve because they didn't have sin in operation uh, fighting them like, like we do. We have a sinful nature. We sin by nature, but we also sin by choice. But they really, truly, in the greater sense, had true free will, and they chose to sin against God without that sin nature, you know, making him do it. So that was completely a choice that they had made themselves. Absolutely. Anybody else? When is it written down? When is your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life? Sometimes it's in there. It's in there already. You take that out. Or if it's over and it's on the Christian angel. Well, now I know there's a Book of Life, and there's also the Lamb's Book of Life. Yeah. And the Word of God talks about your name being blotted out of the Book of Life. So I think, yeah, I think your name's already in there. Because God, it's God's will that all what be what saved, right? But like he says, if you go against, like he says, if you if you change the wording or you go against what is written in the book of Revelation, all these plagues will be added unto you. You know, your name will be blotted out of the book of life. So in other words, it wasn't the Lamb's book of life. It was blotted out of the book of life. But I think the minute that you truly get saved, you repent of your sin and you ask Christ to forgive you and you believe that he was raised from the dead, the minute that you get saved is when your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Because he even told the disciples, don't rejoice. Don't rejoice in that demons obey you, but rejoice that your name has been written down. Already already been written down. Yes, that would be the Lamb's Book of Life. Yes. I saw it, yes, I do believe there's God has a book of life with every single person that's ever he's ever created that's in it. And if they don't get saved, they get blotted out of that book. Not not put into the Lamb's book and then blotted out, because then then, then you would lose your salvation. But once you're truly saved, you're in that book forever. Nothing can ever blot you or take you out of the Lamb's Book of Life. But prior to getting saved, your name is in, in the book of life or God's book of life, the general book, I believe. Yes. I believe it is. God's book of life. The books, yes, plural. Scrolls. Because it says that the great white throne and the scrolls were open. The scrolls, meaning one, the Bible is going to be there because Jesus said the word, the word that I've spoken will judge you on the last day. So the Bible is going to be at judgment day. Scrolls, plural, all the deeds that you've ever done, all those are going to be rolled out. And then books, which would, one of them would be the Lamb's Book of Life. And if anyone was not written in that book, was cast into the lake of fire. So the one that it gets blotted out of is, is I believe, the general book of life that God has with every single person born. And when they do repent and give their heart to Christ, they get put into the Lamb's Book of Life. But that would be one book that you'd never be blotted out of because if you did get blotted out of that book, then you would teach that you could lose your salvation, and the Word of God teaches the opposite of that. And there's, you know, there's Book of Remembrance, like it says in Micah, the Book of Remembrance, like he, he, he remembers when people talk about him. He writes it down. So when people have discussions about the Lord, the Word of God teaches us that he writes all that down, the discussions that we have about him. So you have the book of remembrance. Um, you know, you got the bottle of tears. Every tear that you ever cry, the Bible says he puts it in his bottle. Uh, and I know that's metaphoric, however, but it's just talking about the intimacy of how, you know, intimate God is. He knows your footprint, you know, all, all those awesome verses. Well, he, he knows your given name, and he also has a name that he'll give you when you get to heaven as well, I believe. He talks about that stone that has a name written on it that nobody knows. Yes. Yeah. So he absolutely knows your given name. And he, he and if he wants to rename you, he will. Amen. I would, hey, Lord, you want to rename me? You go right ahead. You call me whatever you want. Yes, indeed. I'm just glad I'm here. Amen. Uh, Adele. Yes, yeah, sweet Adele. 
Yes, indeed. Yeah, and, and I do believe that we're going to recognize people instantly when we get to heaven. I do. You know, how do the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration know it was Moses? And Eli- how would they know that? They never even met him, and yet they knew instinctively who they were. You know, it didn't say that Jesus introduced himself. To, hey, hey, by the way, boys, this is Moses, and uh, it didn't say that. It's like almost, automatically almost knew him. And um, I think that's awesome. Yes, indeed. Seeing Jesus in his, his full, his full Shekinah glory. Wow. Man, that's going to be, what a day, what a day it's going to be, man. Boy, what an awesome day. Man, to meet all the Bible characters. Hey, hey, Eve, I forgive you. I forgave you a long time ago. <laughs> you know, she's going to get ribbed. Uh, girl, man, you mess it up for everybody, man. Son. <laughs> and then and then you'll see my guardian angel. Just look for the one over there on the bench all like this. <laughs> man, Lord Jesus, man, I, man, I, I wish you would have killed that joker 10 years ago, son. <laughs> uh, all right well i figured we would take a break and just kind of do a general thing i hope you didn't mind because i was fully prepared to do what we were going to do but i figured hey maybe you got some stuff on your heart and mind and just want to get it out any other questions at all before we close yes ma'am What's the next lesson, it's, we're gonna we're gonna look at nehemiah and then we're gonna move on Who, who's after nehemiah who can tell me yes. who yes. anna yes. oh esther Oh, Esther? Oh, yeah. And what's she famous? What was her famous words? Or what was the famous words in that book? The, the, it's the one scripture that's quoted at, at all. When that book is quoted, that scripture is quoted. Yes. For such is a time as this. Have you ever had one of those moments? For such is a time as this? All right. Well, all hearts and minds clear. Well, I just want to say I appreciate you guys love your patience your encouragement towards me and I hope and pray with all my heart that these are beneficial to you I truly do and um, and I thank you so much for your kindness all right let's go to the Lord in prayer father thank you for this time that you've given to us I pray now with all my heart that you'll uh, be with us as we dismiss Lord help us to man perspectively Lord just remember that we're witnesses Help us to invite people to come to our church. Help us to witness. Give us those opportunities. Give us the wisdom to see those opportunities, Lord. And Lord, I just want to say thank you for each and every one that's here. I pray with all my heart, Lord, that you will bless them uh, for being here today. Help them draw close to you. Lord, help us all draw close to you. We just ask that you'll continue your mighty hand of protection upon us. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.